good afternoon everybody um, I didn't realize when I was going I was named chair that my job would involve standing that there was in fact no chair uh, I was also under the impression that chairs are supposed to be seen and not heard very much, but since uh, Glenn and, and Richard this morning sort of took the liberty of, the chair's liberty of saying a few things, I, I, I will, uh, I, I, I might as well keep, keep the tradition too. Uh, I, I was struck by uh, Professor Gordon's uh, assertion this morning that uh, Cars were never in, included in uh, in productivity growth and, and, and GNP growth till, ni till, till 1935. But I take away a completely different uh, uh, inference from it, which is it, it tells me how bad most of these measures are. Uh, that if cars were not included till, till 1935, then all, most of what you're measuring is noise and very little signal. And, and so, you know, whether there's decline or whether there's not decline, I think is, is to a great degree a matter of opinion. And uh, it's, in the main, it's harmless opinion, except when it comes to things like, I suppose, adjusting uh, social security payments and, uh, and, and setting, uh, 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 but that, 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 that there, there are, uh, there are important, useful issues as well, which I which I think come come through in the three papers in, in the three in the three papers that that we're seeing. A little bit of a digression. Uh, I'm thrilled with Ned's book, and I'm thrilled with Ned's book because he talks about grassroots innovation and grassroots entrepreneurship. And uh, I accidentally encountered grassroots innovation about and entrepreneurship 25 years ago when I started studying uh, rapidly growing businesses. So I, I studied hundreds of them. And they, were all, they all fit the, the model of, 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 grassroots, uh, of grassroots innovation. Uh, and to some degree, they, 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 or to a large degree, they were a reflection of the economy we live in. So to most of them were not science or technology-based uh, enterprises, at least directly. I mean, so there was possibly science and technology at, 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 at some remove. They were, in, they, they, they were indigenous in, 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 in that sense. Uh, most of them were involved in the untradeable sector of the economy. I mean, uh, as we know, roughly more than 80% of the American economy is, is in the untradeable sector. And much of it is in the service sector. And so th th then we are faced with the practical, important question not of whether there is decline or whether there is not decline. I mean, frankly, who, uh, at least I don't particularly care who, uh, how you come up, uh, where, where you end up there, but how does one keep dynamism in this, this untraded service sector? And where things are difficult and, 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 and challenging, uh, and Dick Nelson has uh, a view ab ab about those challenges. Uh, Professor Vidge uh, has a, a view about those challenges in, in, again, an important untraded sector, sort of how do we stop me from getting old? Uh, and then there's, th there's a third sector which, uh, there's a third paper which, uh, I guess, I haven't seen the latest version, but it's, uh, I I'd call it, Italian exceptionalism. I mean, Gibbons's Roman Empire declined, but apparently it continues to decline. And, and so, I mean, what could go on declining for thousands of years? And and uh, and, and Luigi will tell us about how. We, I'm reminded of this cartoon of the cat being at the bottom of a pit, and when, when and, she, and, and she says, "When you just when you think you've hit bottom, someone hands you a shovel." So. Uh, so Luigi will talk about that, and, uh, and so here we are. Um, uh, Dick, would you like to to get started? Yeah. I enjoy I enjoyed the sessions this morning. Uh, I have uh, uh, quite a bit of sympathy with uh, uh, both of the different points of view that have uh, been expressed. Uh, I have uh, uh, I believe that uh, some of uh, 
Uh, Bob Gordon's uh, concerns uh, are right on the money, and I'm concerned about those kinds of things, too. Uh, I think that uh, 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 Joel's point of view on what is going to happen regarding relatively uh, sophisticated areas of technology uh, are quite likely to be right. Uh, and um, uh, that's, a, that, that's a different point of view, but it's not clear to me that they are uh, uh, basically uh, uh, incompatible. Uh, they're off to the side of, uh, of one another. I'm going to diverge somewhat from my, from my notes, uh, reflecting uh, my, my listening of the, to the conversation this morning. We'll see how it goes. The, the paper uh, that I prepared for the Still working? Yes. The paper that I prepared for this um, uh, conference, uh, behind the scenes in this, these notes, uh, dealt with um, uh, three uh, broad features of, uh, of innovation uh, in the post-World War War II period. Uh, I confess being surprised uh, this morning that uh, aside from Joel, uh, nobody really was talking very much about uh, the extremely uh, great importance of, of scientific and knowledge and training uh, to innovation, uh, in particularly in the uh, the post World War II period, uh, and and increasingly, uh, so uh, there certainly is a lot of uh, popular uh, non science based innovation uh, going on. But on the other hand, if you uh, ask, as uh, uh, Ned and uh, Bob did. Uh, uh, about what are the, the, the major sources of the remarkable uh, increases in uh, living standards that have, uh, have occurred in the, in the West uh, since the, uh, uh, the early part of the 19th century, but particularly uh, after uh, uh, the third quarter of the 19th century, a uh, remarkable uh, fraction of those uh, would have been completely impossible uh, without uh, the development of, uh, of uh, strong and stronger uh, scientific knowledge. Uh, I am now running on reserve battery power. Does that mean anything? Uh, we'll, we'll see. I'll push up. Okay. So what's going on here? Just going, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, about, about that, because I think it's very important in understanding uh, what has been happening uh, in, in, in the world over the uh, uh, last uh, uh, half century or so. Uh, that's going to be associated with a discussion of the, the very particular and special sources of, uh, the U of, of the post-World War II uh, era, the last a little bit less than a quarter of a century, of uh, really overwhelming uh, uh, U.S. technological dominance uh, across a very wide uh, uh, arena of, of industries and, 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 and economic uh, ac activities. And I think you cannot understand what has been happening uh, in the period of uh, economic growth slowdown uh, uh, in, unless you understand what, uh, uh, what lay behind the, 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 the enormous well-being and widely spread well-being uh, in, in the U.S. that later on spread to, to Europe uh, after World War uh, II. And I want to talk about the, the particular reasons for the, the, the erosion uh, of, of U.S. dominance, because I think that is um, uh, a very important matter uh, shaping uh, the current situation. And third, in a way, I'm going to pick up on uh, some of uh, Bob Gordon's uh, uh, concerns uh, about um, 
uh, whether uh, technological innovation uh, in the, the, the coming years is going to be contributing as much to uh, improvements in perceived standards of living and well-being uh, uh, as uh, uh, they did uh, in, in, in the earlier earlier period uh, and I'm going to propose that uh, in fact what, what is what is increasingly happening uh, is that be, technological advance has been highly uneven across sectors and, and activities and uh, the areas where technological advance has been very rapid and is likely to continue to be rapid uh, may be yielding uh, diminishing social returns. And that there are a wide range of, uh, of, of activities and needs in modern societies that are becoming increasingly important uh, and uh, uh, requiring uh, the allocation of uh, a larger and larger fraction of, uh, of society's resources where technological advance, where productivity advance has been very, very slow indeed. Uh, and it may very, be very difficult uh, to uh, uh, improve performance in, in those uh, areas. Uh, I will observe now that uh, uh, this is a point that uh, was made about 50 years ago uh, by, by Bill Balmel, uh, and I'm going to be elaborating on it. Uh. As I said, I was, I was surprised by how little discussion there was, except for Joel, uh, on the, the, the importance of the, uh, the, the science, uh, broadly speaking, enterprise in, uh, in, in the advanced industrial uh, nations. I do not think you can characterize modern capitalism uh, anymore uh, without a quite detailed description uh, and characterization uh, of uh, the, the modern scientific uh, enterprise. Uh, there are a couple of uh, observations that were made this, this morning uh, that uh, suggest that uh, there still is a widespread view that the, the way that science and scientific advance contributes to technical advance uh, is that uh, science leads and you have particular scientific discoveries and breakthroughs and that uh, uh, this uh, in turn opens up uh, uh, technological opportunities uh, in, in various areas. Uh, the, the pathway from, uh, from, from, from Maxwell to Marconi uh, is I think what uh, people uh, have in mind. Uh, but. Uh, I think there is much less understanding uh, than there should be uh, that the bulk of the expenditure on science uh, in modern societies uh, is spent uh, in, in fields that are like oncology uh, or the agricultural sciences uh, or in engineering or in fields like metallurgy uh, or uh, or computer science. What you have here is a, a wide range of scientific fields that account for the bulk of the budget uh, in science uh, that uh, are oriented deliberately uh, to advancing practice uh, in uh, various areas of, of, uh, of human activity, uh, many of them associated with particular uh, technologies. Uh, these are major fields of, of, of teaching uh, and research. And I would uh, propose that uh, uh, if you compare the situation now with what uh, was the case, uh, say, 75 or 100 years ago, uh, that nowadays uh, training uh, in uh, these, these, these fields, relatively advanced training uh, often, uh, is an absolutely pre pre prerequisite uh, for being effective uh, in doing technological uh, uh, innovation. And as I, as I proposed earlier, uh, the innovations that have really counted in uh, improving standards of living over the last century or so uh, have been uh, highly uh, technological uh, in, in, in nature. 
I'm also going to propose that the uh, the development of uh, these fields of, uh, of science and engineering uh, have been a very major factor uh, in the, uh, the spreading, uh, uh, the possibility of spreading of technological uh, knowledge uh, uh, across the world. You cannot understand the uh, development of, uh, of Taiwan and, and, and Korea. Uh, in the, the 1970s and 1980s, uh, or uh, portions of India uh, more recently, or of China, uh, unless you understand that these are based on very high levels and broad training uh, in science and engineering uh, that have gone on uh, in, in those countries. Uh, this is a phenomenon very, very different than the experiences of catch-up uh, that uh, uh, you, you, you were observing earlier uh, in, 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 in history. So let me turn to uh, the 1945-1970 uh, period. Uh, I think it's, it's apparent that while uh, Bob Gordon uh, put a long uh, series of uh, statistics, uh, time series, uh, up bef before us. I think that so much of the, the, the comparison, so much of the feeling that economic growth has slowed down uh, in the United States and the West uh, is associated with a comparison uh, with uh, uh, what was going on in, in, in the quarter century uh, uh, after World War, World War II. Uh, and I want to uh, propose, uh, as I did a number of years ago in a, in a paper that I wrote with, uh, with Gavin Wright, uh, that uh, the, the sources of American technological dominance uh, post-World War II were rather special. Uh, there are really two of them. One of them was uh, of relatively long standing. And this was um, uh, a significant technological lead in what uh, Alfred Chandler uh, called uh, industries with very significant economies of scale and scope. Uh, mass production and, and varied uh, production. And here, well, the basic root of it was that uh, the, the United States by the last part of the 19th uh, century was overwhelmingly the world's largest uh, common market and a relatively rich common market. And in a wide range of uh, uh, fields uh, with the uh, advent of, of the railroad and, and telegraph, you had companies uh, growing up in the United States that uh, were selling on a large market and at much larger scale than you saw anywhere uh, in, 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 in Europe. So that was of long standing. That did not influence uh, world trade that, that much for a period of time. Uh, did strikingly after World War II. The United States also uh, held a, 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 a significant uh, advantage after World War II uh, in what came to be called high-tech industries, which are basically what Joel was uh, uh, talking, talking about. And that was relatively new. If you uh, ask the question, uh, where uh, was the scientific, uh, and in many areas outside of mass production, technological leadership, uh, uh, residing uh, prior to World War II, prior to the 1920s, almost invariably be in, in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, up until World War II, uh, if you wanted to be a, a first class uh, trained physicist and you were an American, you would do undergraduate work in the United States and you do your postdoctoral work, you do doctoral work uh, in the UK uh, or in Germany. And all this, this changes uh, with, with, with World War uh, II uh, and uh, the massive investments in, in, in science and technology that were made uh, after that. Uh, and that experience and the 
the threat of the Soviet Union uh, after World War II uh, led to just remarkable changes in U.S. policy in this area. In a sense, uh, the U.S. invented uh, large-scale public investments uh, in uh, science uh, and technology education and in the funding of, of, of science and technology. Uh, through the Department of Defense, uh, NASA, the Atomic Energy Commission. A lot of it is located in defense, uh, and a lot of the American lead in high tech uh, is in areas like aircraft and electronics and materials. Uh, but at the same time, the U.S. also is putting in place what remains the, the world's largest by far uh, publicly funded uh, a set of programs in in uh, both research and, and, and teaching in the medical area uh, through the National uh, Institutes uh, of Health. Uh, and so by the 1950s, you saw just a U.S. dominance uh, in, in industry, uh, picking up the old dominance in, in, in mass production, uh, but adding to it uh, dominance in the, in, in the new high-tech industries of the, uh, the, the post-World War. Uh, era. Uh, and uh, companies in other countries were having a great deal of difficulty uh, in, uh, in a sense, catching up or, or imitating, in large part because prior to that, uh, uh, the basic economic environment that they were serving uh, uh, didn't uh, uh, warrant uh, the, the U.S. practices that we're using in mass, mass production. Uh, and uh, to a very considerable extent, what was lying behind the high tech in the U.S. was just very, very large-scale government uh, uh, funding uh, of, of R&D and, and education uh, to a considerable extent in defense, uh, which was kept moderately closed from other countries. I would propose that what was going on there uh, generated very considerable market power uh, on the part of uh, U.S. Uh, manufacturing firms. And since there was very little in the way of a threat uh, to these firms from other countries, particularly low-wage countries, uh, and there is a certain uniformity uh, across companies uh, in an industry uh, in the expectations regarding wages uh, and salaries that they paid, that uh, the market power was taken out to a non-trivial extent uh, in high and rising wage and salary rates, uh, and not just uh, in, in profits. Manufacturing then was a very significant fraction uh, of the total U.S. Uh, economy, uh, much more so than uh, in, in recent years. Uh, and so what you had uh, going on in manufacturing uh, was also spread out uh, to the services as well. Uh, and uh, so this was an era of, uh, of, of high and rising wage rates uh, in the United States uh, associated with uh, basically U.S. Uh, technological dominance. Much of the period changes, differences in the period uh, since around 1970 uh, in, in, in the United States, uh, I would propose, uh, have to do uh, with the erosion of that dominance uh, that was beginning to take shape in the, the late uh, 1960s, just about the time you were getting this rash of studies uh, about uh, the technology gap uh, from the from the OECD, uh, the European uh, companies were, were were catching up, uh, and uh, so were the Japanese. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, as I'll get to in a minute, uh, you had uh, Korea and Taiwan. Uh, first of all, you had this uh, the the enormous opening up of uh, of trade. Uh, uh, Within Europe, uh, the United States, uh, which had for many years had been uh, a highly protectionist uh, country, as 
uh, most of you uh, know, uh, dropped its trade barriers significantly. Uh, more generally, cat GATT kicked in. At the same time, there was a growing internationalization of business and finance. The world became a common market, uh, and in a sense, the U.S. lost its advantage uh, in industries uh, like steel and uh, automobiles and uh, a wide range of, of other uh, mass production uh, fields. Uh, I would propose, uh, and I don't think this has been studied as, as closely as it ought to be, that the, the rise of the importance and power of the applied sciences and engineering disciplines uh, as fields of research and study and teaching uh, had an awful lot to do uh, with the remarkable spread of technologies uh, that uh, began to occur uh, uh, in the uh, in the 70s uh, to uh, to countries that at least were training a significant cadre uh, of, of scientists and engineers and uh, were supporting uh, a non-trivial uh, program uh, of, uh, of science and, and, and technology uh, funding. Uh, Korea, Taiwan, later on India, China. Uh, what is quite, quite fascinating is if, if you read the accounts of how Japan uh, picked up and came to master uh, Western technology. Yes. Uh, and compare that with Korea and Taiwan. Uh, Korea and Taiwan did much more of it on their own, uh, with their own trained uh, scientists and engineers who were much less dependent uh, on, uh, on direct help uh, from American and, and European uh, countries. Uh, and uh, I would propose that what was the, the net result of all this uh, was a significant decline uh, in the rate of productivity growth in the U.S. because, not because innovation slowed down in the U.S., uh, but because, uh, in a sense, the advantages of innovation in the U.S. were uh, not uh, paying off anywhere near uh, what they had uh, done uh, earlier. Struck by an article by Paul Samuelson in uh, 2004 uh, that uh, uh, is making a, a very similar argument, uh, actually. I would like to go on to make uh, a, a point in detail, but I'll just make it uh, briefly. Another thing that has happened, uh, as I observed uh, at, the, at the start, uh, is that over this period of time, the allocation of resources has shifted increasingly into the services. Uh, and in a sense, what has happened is we've had high technological advance in a wide variety of fields and have begun to experience uh, non-trivial diminishing returns in terms of uh, uh, the uh, satisfaction of human needs uh, that uh, uh, technological advance is is achieving there. But now you have fields like education uh, that are uh, uh, absorbing a, a growing fraction of resources and a variety of other uh, services as, as well. And these are areas where technological advance has been very slow indeed uh, over, over the years. And I think it's sort of an, an innate characteristic of them that technological advance will be very difficult uh, to, to achieve. Uh, so in a way, I, I end up with a proposition uh, that's a little differently structured than, than Bob Gordon's uh, one uh, that he presented uh, this morning. Uh, but in a way, is very similar. It's not at all in contradiction to Joel's. Uh, uh, observations. Uh, I think increasingly 
the, the kinds of innovations that are most needed uh, in the United States uh, in Europe are in fields and in activities and concerned with areas of human wants where we have had the greatest difficulty uh, in advancing productivity uh, in the past, where technological advance has been very difficult uh, uh, to, to achieve, and there are good reasons for that, uh, and uh, that therefore we may uh, continue to have the sense that uh, economic growth uh, is buying us less and less uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the improved satisfaction of important human wants. Thank you very much for the invitation to this fascinating conference. Uh, uh, this morning was uh, uh, the most enjoyable uh, moment, uh, and I learned a lot in this debate between various types of pessimism and optimism. So uh, we see the technological uh, pessimist, uh, Robert. We see the technological optimist, Joel. And we've seen an institutional optimist, Gelfi. And what I will come down to, I am a technologically optimist, but institutional pessimist. Um, why am I technologically optimist? Because I do believe in the power of uh, human ingenuity, and I do believe in the argument that Joel was making. It's sort of, uh, uh, it's true that the low-hanging fruits have been caught. It's also true we have bigger ladder. And in fact, because we are here in the Italian house, I think it's important to remember the important change in attitude that brought the Italian Renaissance, and in particular, Giordano Bruno was saying, we are dwarf, but dwarf sitting on the shoulders of giants. And as such, we can achieve more. And that change in attitude is what made progress possible. If we, are, if we embrace too much sort of what Robert is saying, it's a self-defeating attitude, because we are going in the direction of saying, uh, the great scientists are behind us, and as such are never achievable, and what we have to do is study their greatness. That's what sort of a, a long period in history was dedicated to, and was not, from a technological point of view, a great period in history. So I think from that point of view, I am a technologically optimist. However, I'm not an institutional optimist like Gelf is, and I think that uh, History, I'm not a connoisseur of history like uh, uh, Joel is, but uh, you know, just look at uh, what uh, Yuan was saying at um, lunch today. Uh, look at the history of uh, the decline of the Roman Empire. Uh, had a lot of opportunities for having institutional change that didn't take place. And, uh, and great civilizations do die uh, in spite of the fact there are plenty of opportunities to bounce back because there are some sort of uh, political failures. And that's what I fear uh, is happening, not only in my own native country, that's already happened, but I think it's happening increasingly so in uh, the United States. And since this session is a session about uh, the public and private forces toward the decline, uh, what I want to stress is that there is a terrible combination of public and private forces in the direction of the decline that is sort of uh, the incentives that you give in a society for rent seeking over innovation. So I do believe that if we put enough resources into innovation, we can sort of maintain a higher level of productivity growth. My concern is that these investments are not made and the US society is becoming increasingly a society where rent seeking pays much more than innovating, and that is what might lead to a decline of this country and uh, uh, of the West in general. Now, my proposition is based on the idea that uh, uh, rent seeking has gone up both in level and in returns. Now, if you are looking at a typical production function, which is concave, you, you say that cannot be true. How can you be, have at the same time an increase in the average and increase in the marginal? But we know from Gordon Tarlock and, and many others that uh, that's not the typical uh, shape of a rent-seeking 
uh, production function. In fact, it might have increasing return to scales. And so what are the forces that I see as sort of uh, uh, underlying this trend, which I view as very negative? The first one is that, uh, if you want it benign, but that eventually people realize that Gordon Tullock was right. In 1972, he wrote this very short piece saying, you know what, there is too little money in politics. And uh, even at those numbers that were much lower, uh, that sort of uh, things was considered sort of uh, crazy because you say, wait a minute, there are a lot of money in politics, why uh, are you saying so? And uh, with more than numbers, you can make the calculation very easily. And uh, it costs roughly, uh, I think, $2 billion to run the entire presidential campaign, and another $2 billion to run the congressional races, uh, add a few for the Senate. In, roughly with $5 billion, you can buy the U.S. government. And, uh, with the U.S. government, you get to allocate uh, a budget which is many times that uh, for at least two years. Then you have to face new congressional election. But sort of, uh, uh, if you look at the price of a ticket, you think about a lottery, and the, the price of the lottery is very large, and the tickets are basically uh, selling too, too low. And this is like uh, the intuition of Gordon Tallock in 1972. And unfortunately, he was so right that since then, we have seen more and more money flowing into politics in, in the wrong direction. And the return to sort of uh, uh, lobbying is still increasingly large. Uh, some researchers have sort of done a study um, of uh, the lobbying behind the American Job Creation Act of 2004. As you probably remember, uh, sort of uh, U.S. multinationals lobby to repatriate their foreign profits at a 15% tax rate instead of a 35% tax rate. In the, as a result of this effort that cost them roughly, if you sum up everything, $282 million, they won a $62.5 billion tax savings. So the return is 220 to 1. I challenge you to find any legal or even illegal activity in the United States that give you that return. I'm not an expert in cocaine dealing, but I think that even cocaine dealing does not give you that kind of returns, and certainly with much higher risk. So uh, that forget sort of uh, property production equipment, forget technology, forget anything. This is the most valuable investment in the United States today. And uh, sure enough, people learn how to do it. And, you know, in the old days, lobbying was a very valuable activity. As a libertarian, I think that was very valuable because it was about getting the government off your back. Unfortunately, companies have graduated from that, from that and they've learned that lobbying is not only useful to get the government off your back, it's also useful to get government in your pocket. And they've become extremely good at doing that. There is a very sophisticated lobbying industry that has made Washington a very rich place. You know, in the old days, I'm told that Washington was a boring place to go. There was no the excitement of uh, New York, not even of Chicago or, or L.A. or San Francisco. Today, Washington is one of the most exciting and rich cities in the United States. Seven of the tenth wealthiest counties are in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Now, nothing gets produced in Washington except laws. So basically, all that money is money, is money that is directly and indirectly uh, coming from uh, uh, lobbying. Uh, paradoxically, I would say another reason why lobbying has gone up so much is because of a loss of ideological tension. If you go back to the 50s and 60s when uh, uh, Joel was uh, uh, remembering and when he was taking the class with uh, uh, Joe Stiglitz, most of the people were sort of uh, considered themselves either socialist or communist. So ideologically, there were a lot of people that were anti-market. And as a result, people were on the other side and were defending sort of uh, the market side had to be, behave better. And so it was not that easy to buy off people just with money. Now that ideological uh, sort of divide have fallen, 
the only thing that is left is money. And so even the Democrats are not saying we are anti-business. They actually compete to get more lobby money than the Republicans. So the race is on, and we don't know who is winning. We definitely know who is losing, which is sort of uh, the public at large and uh, us in general. But what I'm particularly concerned about is what I call the vicious circle that I've seen sort of playing in Italy uh, for such a long period of time and is so destructive of a society and can definitely lead to the decline also in the United States. The more money you can get from lobbying, the more you select good lobbyists and not good managers. The more you select good lobbyists, the more companies get addicted to that, and the more they need that. Uh, I always tell the story that when I first visited the Grand Canyon, I was struck by a note that say, please don't feed the wild animals. And underneath was written, because if you feed them, you destroy their ability to basically gather food in the wilderness and survive long term. Now, of course, the animals did not put that note, the humans did, because if the animal could, they say, please sort of uh, give me good food and please not McDonald's, but they, they, I, I can eat better food. Uh, they don't allow animals to choose that. Now, I would like to put the same note underneath Congress, saying, please don't feed business. And underneath a note saying, the reason why we don't want to feed business is precisely because we love business. Because we want business to be able to compete in the long term. And the best way to make it competitive in the long term is to not favor it, not to subsidize, precisely like the animals. So the more you're pro-market, the more you have to be strict with business and not subsidize it. Unfortunately, this in the current political environment is completely lost. President Obama, who campaigned in 2008, against Bush and the Medicare Modernization Act that according to his view at the time bought the consensus of the big pharmaceutical industry by restricting free trade in drugs, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, in uh, what he did when he did Obamacare, the first thing he did is to s strike a nice compromise with the pharmaceutical industry uh, in order to prevent free trade in drugs so that uh, they were on the same page. And uh, unfortunately, the Republican Party has been able to do worse, which is difficult to imagine, but they did. Defending the farm subsidies at the same time as they were cutting down the food stamps. So even if sort of uh, everybody makes fun of my country for the prime minister we used to have and is still around, I have to say that unfortunately, in uh, Berlusconi represents sort of a danger that is easily spreadable in other countries, including this. The only merit of Berlusconi, sex apart, is to be so transparent in what he does. In a sense, for people who are not very familiar, it's sort of uh, Berlusconi is not simply a leader of the party, he owns a party. Uh, it was founded by him and his employees, uh, is funded by him, and he determines who among his employees will be elected in Congress. Sometimes they're not employees of former law lovers, but that's sort of a, a by, by, uh, irrelevant point. And he also decides who is appointed as cabinet minister. So basically, he decides not only the political line of his party, but of course the policy uh, that is re relative to his companies and also his personal life. And this is, law has been changed many, many times to reduce sentences so that he could get away. And today, the, the government is an hostage of his position because he's trying to get away for the, the 20th time. Now, you think that as American, we are completely protected against this. But let's think again. It's true that the Congress is not owned by anybody directly. However, a lot of congressmen people and a lot of secretaries of states and treasury, etc., are former employees and future employees of a few companies. Now, the good news is are a few companies, not just one, so competition is always better. 
And you know, there is a degree of decency because they're not literally on the payroll as they serve Congress. However, we know incentives in economics, so they look forward to a future job and they act in the interest of their future employees. So Berlusconi is simply a vertically integrated version of the US Congress. And now you might think that uh, what Berlusconi stands out for is his power on the media, which is absolutely true. In a sense, he owns half of the TV and uh, he controls directly and indirectly the other half that is state owned through his party. So the combination is there is very little sort of uh, uh, open uh, criticism in at least the public media. Now, there are a few newspapers read by a few people that uh, can say whatever they want, but the large public is only as close to one point of view. Now, of course, uh, so that the United States are better. There is not this gigantic concentration. But when you look at the power of a few advertiser company on the US public media, you are worried. In a sense, think about what happened to uh, the situation with the tobacco investigation. CBS initially was forced to pull out uh, the interview, and only later uh, the interview was broadcast. So the problem is there. And finally, sort of, uh, and again, let's keep sex apart, because that's not an important part. If you look at the other crimes that Berlusconi is convicted for, or is about to be convicted for, uh, most of them are perfectly legal in this country. In a sense, what he has been convicted is tax fraud by having some foreign subsidiary that was basically reducing his tax liability. This is what Google and uh, most of US companies are doing every day. It's legal, it's a difference, but why is it legal? Because they were more successful than Berlusconi in passing law that allowed them to do. The other thing that Berlusconi is accused of is sort of uh, buying a member of the Senate. Now, this is done all the time in the United States. It's not done with cash. It's done with pork barrel. But what difference does it make? It's sort of, a, we are economists. We know things are substitutable. So this is basically legalized corruption. So what I'm saying is, I think that what we have seen so dramatically taking place in Italy is corrupting the West in general and the United States in particular. And uh, I am the last one to give any credit to Berlusconi, but I hope he will have one credit, which is the one to show how dangerous this is and alert people that it is not too late to change. Thank you. Well, I'm really very grateful for this invitation. Uh, of course, I'm not an economist. I'm a hardcore molecular geneticist. So I think this was really a bold interdisciplinary move. But I must say, I really uh, enjoy myself enormously. I learned a lot. And I think we should do this more often, Invent, uh, inviting people across disciplines. Now, um, my, my talk today is about uh, the process of aging. I mean, this is a little bit symbolic, I think, for the whole uh, conference uh, decline, but that's not really how I meant it. Uh, is it okay? It's on. It's just if you can, if you can't hear me, just let me know. So, uh, so, so, what I really meant with this is just the introduction of a problem that concerns concerns us all, and also has enormous uh, economic and technological implications. Now, I always thought that uh, uh, I, I mean. For obvious reasons, because I'm, I'm a technologist myself, I love technology, science and technology. But if you really think about it, uh, it's great, of course, to fly and to drive along expressways. But look, how much better is it to live longer? And that's exactly what we did. In fact, technology, science and technology are responsible for an enormous increase in, in lifespan over the last 200 years. I just plotted here, basically, the mortality and, and the lifespan since 1900. So it, 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 I mean, in essence, it simply continues on from or around 1800 when it really started to uh, the mortality to decline and the lifespan to increase. And, and you can sort of see that here uh, for, uh, for males and, and females. And you see that it's almost monotonously going down mortality initially, and this was already much earlier in the previous century, really mostly because childhood mortality declined enormously 
But later on, and certainly now, also mortality among older people is going down. You can see that this is uh, much better for, for women than for men. Although at the very end, you can see that you get a, close to the year 2000, and that seems to plateau off. For men, that's still not the case, so probably they will move closer. You can see that here again, but then translated into uh, the lifespan. The median age at death, as we say. So you can say life expectancy. Now, this enormous peak here has to do with the flu epidemic at the end of the First World War. But basically, the picture is the same. It looks like we sort of begin to reach a plateau here, but that's really very unclear. Now, what are the factors that are responsible for that? Well, there are a few non technological factors as well, of course. But I really think that virtually all of this we owe, we owe it to technology. Uh, of course, uh, agricultural technology, there, there was food security around 1800, I think we begin to, uh, to see that. And as, as Bob Gordon already indicated, uh, toiletry is not unimportant. Access to clean water, sewage, sanitation is important. And of course, then later, the development of vaccines and disinfectants, antibiotics, basically wiped out for a large, to a large extent infectious diseases with the consequences, again, for uh, childhood mortality. Now, anesthesia, together with disinfectants, actually made surgery possible. Before that, it was virtually impossible to do that. And, and again, later, body imaging, of course, allows you very quickly now to see what's wrong with you, and they can, they can help you. Cancer chemotherapy is more successful than a lot of people think. And of course, uh, things like NSH, like aspirin, and also the more recent COX-2 inhibitors, they help you when you have uh, uh, I mean, a number of, uh, for, for example, arthritic problems. Joint replacement surgery, a lot of us can probably already testify that that's actually very useful when you can see your knee or hip replaced. Exactly, Joel is already nodding. So these are all very important uh, uh, new technological development, but also the more humbler cane and walker are actually not unimportant. It allows old people to move around and they stay mobile longer and therefore they also stay healthy longer and they live longer. That's basically what it is. There are many, many more of these inventions. I just listed a few of them. Now, so what do we basically see because of that? That's, of course, the good news. And the good news is that we live longer. And in general, we also are, take fewer children and be more careful with our children. But look at this. This is 2002, and this is predicted for 2050. You see here the percentage of older people. So you see 30% of people are older than 60. Here, this is basically only Europe in 2002. Actually, the United States is a fairly young country and it will stay young and you can sort of see that here in 2050 but here this uh, Canada here Europe uh, Russia and China not unimportantly they have all more than 30 percent people over 60 that's huge you would say well that's not bad news it's great I mean they all have many many old people they get old that's good okay I'll, I'll show you what the consequence of that is this is a typical uh, development in a country like uh, Korea that dramatically increased uh, wealth economically, as you already heard today. Now, uh, look at it this way. In 1970, this was the pyramid. So you have basically people younger than age 15. This is the whole basis of it. Very few people older than 65. And now you see how this country developed and what happens later. And this is what is predicted for 2015. The whole pyramid is turned around, upside down. Now you have a large group of older people. The consequence of that, obviously, is that f fairly small numbers of younger people, working people, active people, have to take care of older people. Now, in a sense, you can say, OK, well, we have this group of older people, but when they just die, then, you know, what's the problem? Well, the problem is this. The problem is this. We know now very clearly, and, and I, I know, I, of course, I realize we all sort of understand that, when you grow older, then your risk of attracting disease is really going up dramatically. You can see that here. This is, this is uh, the aging process. And here you see plotted the incidence of disease. And you can see that this is really for virtually all diseases, this is going up quite dramatically. So basically what you end up with when you have a largely elderly population is people who need a lot of medical care. And that's extraordinarily costly. So this is obviously the problem that we're dealing with. Now, the, the reality is that all our technology development, development of new medicine, which is, of course, a huge chunk of our economy, is really focused on diseases, individual diseases. They're looking at individual diseases. They've been extremely successful with that, but mostly, of course, in fairly younger people. In the very old people, there you are having the problem that you, you have interactions between aging and diseases. And in essence, actually, wrinkles is not a particular disease, although a lot of people take it very seriously. Now, now, so 
the, the fact of the matter is, even if you would take these diseases apart, you would not be able to cure them. They have something in common, and that is the basic mechanisms of aging. And when you, of course, start to address these basic problems in aging, you're going to innovate around aging, then you will hit these diseases all simultaneously. So it's a very efficient way of doing it, and it's not only an efficient way, it's the only way of doing it. You cannot get rid of individual diseases. It's a myth. So, so if medicine is going on along the path that it's taking now, basically dealing with separate diseases, it will become maintenance medicine. It will never ever be able to make further progress, as of course we all want. Now, so the question then that you, that you would ask yourself, okay, is it really possible to really uh, intervene at the level of aging itself, the basic mechanisms of aging, and then hitting all those diseases si simultaneously? So in other words, you could ask the question, is it possible to cure aging? Well, although I'm probably one of the not too many people who should be able to tell you everything about the process, I cannot really answer the question, but I will, I will turn it around. And, and uh, you can also say, is there a scientific reason to assume we cannot? And the answer to that is no, definitely no. There's no reason why we would not be able to, to, uh, to cure aging. And it cannot be, we cannot say when it will be, but I, I just, it's just a biological process like a disease. If you claim that you, can disease can, that you can cure cancer, there's no reason to assume you cannot cure aging. And again, this is sort of like uh, symbolized by, by this book, which I uh, really liked. I, I never thought that a whole bunch of these physical processes were, would be feasible or even possible. But this guy clearly showed that what I thought was impossible is possible. So we should never be too quick to say that something is impossible. Of course, uh, curing aging has a sort of a bad name because there are so many charlatans around. And we have to be extremely careful that we really are focusing ourselves on, on, on good science. But that's not an impossible. Look, I, I'll show you two examples why it's not biologically impossible to intervene at the basic process of aging. When you look at different species, they really have different lifespans. You have this simple mouse, which can live in my laboratory, not in the wild, uh, up to four years. But a squirrel monkey, for example, in, in a zoo can live 30 years. Now, a mouse will never be able to live 30 years. It's really limited to this four years. The same for the squirrel monkey, which will never be able to live to 60 years that the chimpanzee can do, and so for the human. The chimpanzee can never live 120 years. Now here, of course, there's this little uh, clam. It's, it's an ocean quayhawk. It has a little heart. It beats very slow. This animal can actually live for 400 years. As far as I know, it's the oldest animal uh, that we know, oldest living animal that we know. Now, but, but because it is there, of course, why wouldn't we be able to study it and see what we can do to let humans live longer and, of course, staying healthy much longer. That's really critical. As I said, aging and disease is integrated. When you halt one, then you halt the other one automatically. Now, in fact, uh, there are possibilities uh, when you look at humans. This is Jeanne Calmen, just before she died, I believe. And, and she, she died uh, in 1997. Uh, when she was 122 years. This is the oldest living human being. And again, you have to be very careful. Lots of stories about people in the Caucasus who lived to 160, which was all uh, unlikely to be true because when they started to interview them, the men all lived to 160, but the women were never older than 60. So men used to boast. So that was the re reason. When you really study that and you look at birth certificates, that's all fraud. It's really, this is the oldest person that we know. However, that was in 1997. And uh, the oldest person now is about 116, which again is, uh, is sort of uh, anecdotal evidence that it seems maybe that using current methods, the lifespan increase may be coming to an end. We don't know that. But still, 122 is admirable age, I would say. And she was pretty healthy until the very end. Okay, so now what is it? Well, how can we, how can we from a technological point of view, intervene? That's sort of the first thing. And then second, what are the societal constraints about it? Now, first of all, uh, we know that what, what determines lifespan of an, of an organism, of an individual, is really a balance in your biological systems. They invest in maintenance of your tissues, somatic maintenance. But on the other hand, they let you grow and reproduce, which is obviously very, uh, very important. So there's a heavy selection during, during evolution on growing fast and reproducing fast, because that, of course, keeps your genes in, in the family, so to say. But unfortunately, byproducts of rapid growth and reproduction, so you have lots of strong men and strong women, but unfortunately, they build up somatic damage very quickly. So they would never uh, age uh, very long. They, they would die fairly early. In nature, you don't notice it. I mean, uh, humans, sort of in the wild, in the old days, so to say, and also animals, they usually, they never uh, grow very old. They usually die fairly early. So you never notice it. 
But of course, when you have, when you are able to manipulate this, so dampen this growth and reproduction, then you would get the balance to the other side, and you have increased maintenance, and you can probably limit the somatic damage accumulation and live longer. The other way to intervene is not here, but it is actually here. You may be able to get rid of damage, to cure damage, and therefore you may also increase the lifespan. Now, I'll show you some results that actually show that that works. You may not believe it, <coughs> but it does. Again, this is an experiment with worms, but similar results were obtained with flies, in fact a much more advanced uh, animal, and also mice. And what they did here, they hit a particular gene, and they uh, gave a mutation in that gene that uh, not inactivated it, but it dampened it. This is a gene involved in a growth pathway, insulin. It makes you grow. So these worms grow slower, but they live much longer. You see the survival curve. So this is, you start out with a population of worms, so 100% is alive. And here you see the age in days. Worms don't live very long. But here you can see they start to die off, and this is their natural lifespan. But those mutants, they live far, far longer, and they stay very healthy. And I have no time to show this, but there are many other uh, results with other animals. Now this is a similar pathway, we call it the TOR signaling pathway. It's basically also s uh, one of those growth pathways. And here it's more interesting for you because this is actually a drug which was, which was discovered originally on Easter Island. It's an antifungal uh, medicine and initially they didn't realize what it did, but then after a while we realized it was actually inhibiting TOR. And this was actually given to mice, like like a drug you could give to humans. And they gave it, this is another piece of good news for you, they gave it when the mice were actually 20 months old. This is the equivalent of, human six, uh, of a human of 60 years old. And they found out that both in males and in females it extended the lifespan, about uh, 10 to 20%. 10 to 20% would mean that normally, suppose you would expect to die when you're 80, now you would die at about uh, 100, while staying healthy. This, this in dampening of the signaling pathway increases your health also. So it's not so that you live longer but you're in bad health. It simultaneously lengthens your lifespan and it, and it improves your health. This of course is critical and again it confirms exactly what I just said. Diseases of old age are intertwined with the basic mechanism of aging. There's no point in trying to separate them, although a lot of people still do that. Okay, so that was a, sort of the good news. I think this, uh, the science about this is very clear. There's absolutely no reason why we could not continue on and, and explore this further and develop the first generation of pills that make you live longer and healthier. Now, what are the problems here? And there are, actually. There are quite a lot. And this is what I tried to work out here. And for my own understanding, I'm sure you are well aware of it, and it was already discussed. First of all, there's, of course, this interaction between science and technology. It's not only so, of course, that technology comes from science, but it also works the other way around, as was already made it clear. Like, for example, I use uh, automatic sequencers, which are very useful in my science. But, of course, I didn't develop it, but others did. Now, uh, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know how you want to... Uh, how you want to consider that, there are also a society that impacts on science and technology in a very important way. Now, that is a little bit of a problem because in, in medicine, medical technology, I explained it to you, has advanced enormously, but it no longer does. And that's something that a lot of people don't, don't know because, of course, you read newspapers and there are endless articles about smart drugs and smart this and smart that that's coming out. But in fact, if you really think about it, uh, things didn't change that dramatically over the last 30 years. I mean, after all, we can't cure cancer, can we? And we can't cure Alzheimer's disease, so the facts are, are just there. Now, I, I sort of try to list here what, in my opinion, the constraints are, actually, in, in technology-driven medicine. I mean, that's medicine. Technolo medicine is technology-driven. Now, first, I think the major problem is really this enormous regulation. I mean, regulation is obviously good because uh, there were enormous problems, as, as all of you know, with experiments that were done on humans in the past. I'm not only talking about Nazi Germany, but actually the United States government did that. So obviously it's very good that we have strict regulations and that we do not basically overflow the market with pills that may not work at all or are basically toxic or whatever it is. So that's good. But in fact, uh, regulation has increased enormously and uh, there's not even a formal pathway to get pro-longevity drugs approved by the FDA. It, it's, it's not. You cannot basically test uh, drugs that are anti-aging, it's not allowed, Doesn't, it's not there. Now also in clinical trials, uh, they try to keep older people out, obviously because they want 
as I said, there's this focus on younger people in, in developing anti-disease medication. Now, the regulation is a problem here because it made the cost of developing a drug uh, increase enormously. Like in the 1980s or so, 1970s, 1980s, it costed like about $100 million dollars to develop a drug. And that's in current dollars, so it's not, I'm, I'm not talking about inflation here. Now, now this is $1.3 billion. Dollars. And it takes an enormous amount of time to do that. Now, drug companies obviously uh, saw that coming, and since they're smart businessmen, by the way, I assume it's clear that uh, developing medication in this country is really uh, a private business. That's business, that's not the government. The National Institutes on Health is doing research that is supposed to lay the foundation for these novel medications. But it is a commercial thing to develop it. So those companies, they know that this is very difficult. So why would they now, they, they have no incentive to, to make uh, some bold moves here because when something goes wrong with the drug in the last phase of their clinical trials, they lose everything. And they do. Actually 90% of everything that they try out is, is eventually not accepted by the FDA. It doesn't work. Now you also see that the effect of drugs becomes less. Let's say in the 1980s, when you compare a novel drug with a placebo, which is a common, uh, a, a, a common setup in a clinical trial, then the, the beneficial effect of the drug was usually like, say, sevenfold better. Okay? So more recently, in the 2000s, it's only like twofold better. So the effect of drugs is really has gone down very dramatically. And also, as I will show here very quickly, the, actually, the number of drugs uh, approved by the FDA has gone down. You can see that uh, this is like s in the 60s, and it's always, of course, it always fluctuates a little bit. There's like, like a peak here, and since then it has come down. Actually, in 2013 now, we see a little bit, it goes up a little bit. But overall, it's, this, is not, this is not dramatic, but now look at the cost, the expenses. The drug, and this is only the expenses of the drug companies. So they spent a lot more dollars on developing drugs, but the effects are actually less. And also, of course, the NIH has got a lot more money, although the last couple of years, it, it, they did not. But in fact, uh, as compared to the year 2000, and I remember this very well, uh, the total amount of NIH money went up by twofold. Have you seen an effect of that? Really not. So that's not good news. Now, of course, the point is, so, so basically, that, is an, uh, that provides no incentive for drug companies to really uh, try to develop something new, and that's, that's what I sort of illustrate here with uh, a new drug that came out in, well, new, it came out in 2009, Folotin, they called it, by Allos Therapeutics. Now, Folotin is basically methotrexate, which was developed in the 1950s as one of the, or, of, of the earliest chemotherapeutic drugs for cancer. And now you see that Folotin, which is really the scientific name, is, is, di is different. You can look at this like a li little picture, like a riddle, but you can see clearly that where the difference is. You can see it here. So the chemical group is different. So the drug is not exactly the same. They claim that it, makes it, it, it reduces tumor size. It certainly has no lifespan advantage. You don't live any longer. And the costs are about $30,000 a month. So this is not cheap. And again, you, you can understand why this business did that, because obviously, uh, by taking a well-known drug already uh, approved by the FDA, very low risk that this would fail eventually, and, and their costs are very low, so, and they make a lot of money out of it. So obviously, th this is a sound business decision, nothing wrong with it. So that's sort of because of uh, the problem of uh, uh, regulation. And again, not, I don't want to say that it's bad. Now, other, there are other problems, of course. Uh, biomedical research, what I'm doing myself actually, is really not focused on trying to bring new products to, to their patients. What we are focused on is a publication. We want publications in nature and science, that's what we like to have. We need it also because otherwise we are not going to be promoted. Academic promotions are based on your academic accomplishments, not if you were successful in helping out the patient. So the whole research machinery is geared towards individual glory in a sense. Of course that's okay, but, okay. So, but, but, but of course it would be nice if there would be some sort of clear pathway towards translation into patients. There are lots of, uh, lots of attempts right now, but it's still very difficult. I mean, even uh, medical doctors who have a little bit of spare time to do research, they don't really like to, to do real translational work. They would like to come into my lab and study on these molecular pathways, which for them is much easier because otherwise they have to go into very complicated IRB approvals for patients because of all the regulations. So people like to work with animals rather than humans. It's much easier for them. In fact, because there's also regulation now about mice, it's very difficult for me to get, uh, I have to fill out lots and lots of 
uh, paperwork, it's even better to work with flies and, and, and nematodes. You sort of follow where this is going, okay? It's not good. Now, on top of that, and that's, these things are actually all related to each other. Now, uh, preclinical data, so data basically that come from laboratories like mine, I have to say, I, of course, I hope to say, not from mine, but from laboratories like mine, are often unreliable. Uh, I mean, statistics shows that uh, probably even the majority, I hate to say this, of the data that are published, even in journals like Nature and Science, cannot be replicated later. Now, you can see what the problem is when you move that into clinical applications. Now, it's not that nothing happens about that. Nature, for example, now started to introduce very complicated pages that you have to fill out, that you did this and you did that, and how did you do the statistics, and did you replicate it? So they want to do that. The NIH started to introduce ways that you're forced to do a study again. But again, who's going to do that as a scientist? Because again, you cannot get any glory out of it because the, 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 the publication has, has already been there. So uh, organizatorially, this is not a simple thing. Then there's R&D metal management. In the old days, you had a situation, and, and again, you can talk about the famous labs from, uh, from a long time ago, uh, like at t Bell Labs, for example. I can remember, I read some story about a young guy who just got graduated in the 1950s. He, was, he, he got a job at, at at t Bell Labs, and then uh, he was there uh, like, like a couple of weeks, and then he met the guy who hired him. So this guy said, hey, okay, how are you? Uh, how do you like the company? And he said, well, it's great, great, but you know, and then he, he had courage and he said, okay, let, let me ask him, what should I do? And the guy said, how would I know? Okay, that's impossible nowadays. Those left don't exist anymore. The bureaucrats from the top, they tell you specifically what you're supposed to do, which obviously can never lead to great innovation. And I think that's really a problem. Now, in the NIH now, they also start to do that with us. Because the whole, the whole success of the American medical research is based on individual research, uh, uh, well, they call it investigator-initiated research. You make it up yourself. You come up with bold new ideas. Nowadays, more and more research is dictated from the top down. So we can basically apply for a grant, but we have to stick to what they say that we can do. Obviously, not very conducive for, for uh, innovation. And then, of course, there's the ever-increasing administrative burden. And, and uh, an illustration of that is that somebody recently found out that, for example, the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, they have this Office of uh, Outreach or Administration, whatever they call it, and they spent, like, between 2006 and 2012, they spent, like, uh, something like $400 million. So, okay, it's important to outreach and to, 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 to teach and everything, sure, but... That's a lot of money. That's basically like a 300 R01 research grant. You can do a lot of cancer research for that. So not good. Now, the, uh, of course, the final question is, OK, what can we do about it? How can we sort of rest restart it, reignite re that whole uh, innovation? And, and I think, first of all, we need to create standards for preclinical research. That's not the case. For clinical research, there's advanced statistics. You must do double-blind clinical trials and everything. But when I do preclinical pre research, nobody tells me that how I should do it. I tell my people to do blinded studies. They compare two groups. I tell them I personally make codes, and then they don't know what they're measuring, and I can decode it. But who else is doing it? Not many, I can tell you that. Of course, uh, also they should really forget. I mean, this is a very creative country. So, Whenever you apply for a grant to the NIH, it must be mechanism, it must be hypothesis driven. But there's an enormous amount of information that we need, desperately need. That's descriptive research, they don't like it. It's very difficult to get it funded. You need this for translational work, otherwise you cannot do it. Now, of course, we should end this evergreening of drug patents. I, I assume everybody knows what that is, but it's basically like a, a smart business or legal way to extend your rent seeking longer. So when, he, so when you have a patent, you want to exploit it to the bone. That, of course, means you don't need to invent something new. So this is the rent seeking we just heard on the previous speaker. Of course, we want to greatly simplify this clinical trial system. It's really grown out of all proportions and we don't need it. 80%, 8-0 of all the costs are in phase three clinical trials. I think we should abandon phase three clinical trials entirely. The best way to do this is simply to, uh, to allow drugs when new, uh, uh, developmental drugs when they are considered safe, so not toxic, and there's some evidence that they have an effect, let your physician and the patient decide whether they're going to use it. We don't need the FDA for that. That's only holding us up. It, it, it adds enormously for the cost. The only thing is the data should be public. As it is now, clinical trial data run by the pharmaceutical industry are not public. So you participate in a trial, you'll never know what the results are. So, so scientists cannot use that information either. Not, not good. 
finally, we really need to stimulate academics like myself to really do uh, translational work. The only way to do that is to create high-profile translational journals. There's one now they call Science Translational Medicine. Okay, if you send something to try Science Translational Medicine, then it's not mechanistic, they don't take it. I can tell you that. Not a real translational journal. Why don't you create one that's really only going to look at the product? You found something that, that's thorough science, you really did something with it to make it ready to go into, into uh, a clinical practice, and that you, you should be able to publish in a high-profile journal. And of course for us, for, for aging, we need integrated geriatric research clinics where basically uh, basic investigators like myself, they can interact with physicians, even nurses, and actually the patients. So that everything is moved into each other, you can see when you are doing your, your own preclinical work, how this is going to be applied. You see, now I have a very vested interest in making sure that my data can be replicated. I'm not only interested anymore in the publication, I want this to work on that patient. Now that's a whole revolution in medical uh, research, and I'm not at all very confident that's going to happen, but that's at least what I believe. Thank you. We've had three rather different papers, and my not entirely enviable job is to pull them together. I'm going to try and do so, however. I want to begin where Dick Nelson ended, with what I thought was a particularly interesting observation about the way in which technical progress uh, has been focused on, he suggests, essentially manufactured objects, what he called artifacts, rather than services and processes. Now some of that, of course, is simply a, a kind of statistical problem, as Amar Bide said earlier. It's to do with the way we measured things. I was always impressed when David Landis made the point that in 1836, Nathan Rothschild, who was probably the richest man in the world at the time, died despite the best medical attention that uh, money could, could provide for him from a disease which could today be cured by an antibiotic that costs a few cents. If you ask where that is in our productivity statistics, the answer is simply it isn't. But it's not entirely a statistical problem. I think that observation that technical progress, as we see it, has been very largely focused on manufa around manufactured objects is true. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is something that will be familiar to anyone who's dealt with small children, which is that they're very keen to play with new toys, uh, at least for five minutes, which is long enough to require their parents to buy the new toys. But they're very resistant to changes in their established routines. We can speculate on why we have these characteristics, but I think we know that we don't really lose them when we become adults. That's why we have garages full of boys' toys and kitchen drawers full of gadgets we thought might come in handy, uh, but we uh, resist changes to our established processes. And most of us in this room are familiar with universities where we see many of the effects of that. One of the striking paradoxes about universities is the way in which at a superficial level, modern information technology seems to have changed absolutely everything. And then at a deeper level, you find it really hasn't changed anything at all. So what we're doing actually is we're using PowerPoint today to generate the same slides that 20 years ago we would have generated using acetates and 50 years ago we would have reproduced for a class by chalk on a blackboard. Same is true in medical technology. Joel McKeer made this morning the point that if you doubt progress there you should simply look at what is happening every year to the quality of joint replacements and that's true. But what's also true is that it goes back to 1847, I think, 
that a Viennese physician explained that the most useful thing doctors and midwives could do in reducing natal mortality was to wash their hands. It took about 50 years before that made a widespread impact on medical practice. And even today, people in hospitals engage in despairing attempts to try and eradicate uh, infections by persuading professional staff uh, to, to wash their hands. Now, I guess I say, I'm not going to speculate on entirely on the reasons for this, except to observe that requiring people to change their routines requires them to accept that was historically what they did was wrong, whereas giving them the opportunity to implement a new toy does not have that obligation. And that's why it may take generations to change process innovations, to introduce process innovations, and very much shorter time to introduce innovations that are incorporated in gadgets. Now, if one looks at the business implications of that, we start to understand why it is that large companies are rather well suited to incremental innovation which leads to improved products, as we see in industries like automobiles and planes, where although the bases of what they do are essentially the same, the ways in which the details of the way in which it is done has been very largely transformed. But these large companies are actually very poor at implementing new business models. For example, if one takes the automobile industry, that the quality of automobiles has improved very rapidly. But the way in which the process of manufacturing automobiles changed from the assembly line production systems, which were the basis of Henry Ford's revolution, to more modern systems based on just-in-time inventory management, on outsourcing to chains of suppliers, and giving assembly line workers sufficient autonomy to enable them to care about the quality of the product, that was something that could only be achieved by new entrants to the industry in the Far East. And US and European companies have even now found difficult to deploy, and most of them have gone bankrupt in the process of failing to do so. If one looks at the, uh, the aeroplane industry, you have an even more striking example, that the development of low-cost airlines. What happened in that industry was that we've had incremental improvements in the technology of flying. The result of that has been that the cost of flying has fallen steadily. The implication of that was that what had was once an elite product for a small group of business travelers became a mass market product for a very large group of leisure travelers. And that required a reconfiguration of the business models of airlines. But large established airlines could not do it and did not do it. The way in which it was done was by the entry into the industry of new firms with an entirely different business model. And we could spend a good deal of interesting time observing the ways in which large established airlines tried to block that particular process. But in the end, they failed. Most of them have now set up their own low-cost subsidiaries with rather moderate degrees of success. Some of them have tried comprehensively to reconfigure their total business model, but in many cases, in most cases, without very much success at all. Basically, it's easier to set up a new airline from scratch than to reconfigure the business model of an existing airline. And that's the process that is going on in, uh, in this area. It's much easier to implement uh, gizmo, new gizmos than it is to implement changes in business processes. And change in businesses, business processes overwhelmingly come from new firms, from new entrants to the industry. Now, that's very relevant to the pharmaceutical industry, which, which we've just been talking about where we have an industry that has been one of the great success stories of the period 
since the Second World War. The modern pharmaceutical industry has made a very large contributions to properly measured productivity growth. But the products on which the success of that industry has, have been based have been very largely products with particular characteristics. Put bluntly, they are drugs which are, are, palliat are, are palliatives for the chronic diseases of rich people, typically depression, hypertension, stomach acidity, and over high cholesterol. And it's on groups of drugs round about these pharmacological effects that the profitability and success of the, the, of the pharmaceutical industry has been developed. The industry is not, does not have a business model which is very well adapted to a wider range of drugs. And probably what has happened is the number of drugs that fit the particular characteristics which I've described is actually quite small and quite a small proportion of the total of potentially successful pharmacological inventions. If one looks at the other areas in which pharmacology has developed in the last couple of decades, probably its major success has been in developing um, and the anti-AIDS drugs which is a complex cocktail of drugs, partly developed in the private sector, partly developed in the public sector, one which has fitted very badly into the traditional business model of the pharmaceutical industry. We're now faced with the prospect of many more drugs which not being mass market drugs in the way that historically the blockbusters have been, where the industry should be trying to earn a billion dollars by not by charging $100 to 10, 10 million customers, but by charging $100,000 to 10,000 customers. And the total revenues from that process may, may be the same, but both the politics and the economics of trying to recover costs in that way are in fact very different. I think the result of the weakness of that business model has led, for example, to some of the failures of the pharmaceutical industry. We've talked about COX-2 inhibitors, where essentially the problem has been trying to sell a rather effectively targeted drug into a mass market as a, as a mass consumer product, at which it was not well adapted, and so on. But what we've seen in that industry, and we've had described the way in which we've observed it in that industry, has been the ways in which established firms have used the political power which their existing position and profitability confers on them to try and resist innovation in business models and to entrench their established position through some of the forms of rent seeking that have been described. And that leads us very directly into the issues which were raised by Luigi. Well, Luigi's uh, paper and comments were prompted by the peculiar and horrific experience of pol recent politics in Italy. And we can equally discuss for a long time this afternoon the fortunate question of why it is that Berlusconi, although electable in Italy, is plainly not electable in Britain or the United States or in most other advanced Western countries. But that really isn't the issue that Luigi is raising. The issue he, he is raising is the ways in which industries, the pharmaceutical industry is, is only one, the financial services industry is obviously the, the, the most extreme, but the ways in which a collection of large established firms in, well, in, 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 in traditionally profitable industries have been increasingly using their power to resist innovation in business models. The industry in which we have that problem, perhaps most acutely at the moment, outside financial services, is media industries, where we have a group of established firms who have no obvious continuing role in that particular market, but a very considerable power to resist innovative business models uh, that would make their products uh, or, or the products we wish to distribute in these ways much more widely available. What Luigi has brought home to us 
in the ways in which these, the ways in which these issues arise in almost all Western countries, even if in different forms in different countries. The origins, for example, of French and German corporatism are very different from the origins of US corporatism. But many of the practical results are actually much the same. In particular, the identification of a national interest with the interests of a few large firms currently operating in that particular industry. In countries like Britain or Scandinavia and other parts of Northern Europe, there are higher levels of trust, lower levels of corruption in the, the, than some of the other countries we've been talking about. But the blunt fact is you, if you look at the countries that come top of the Transparency International ratings for trust and absence of corruption, you identify countries like Canada and Norway, which are not the countries that come top of the list when you think about the innovative capacity of the countries involved. And perhaps there are reasons for that, that the association of trust and collegiality involves a, a constant pursuit of consensus which is not really consistent with a kind of diversity and uh, receptiveness to innovation which we need if we're to achieve the kind of productivity gains which we're looking for. So my conclusion in the end is that there is probably no country in the West which has managed the balance we're seeking in these areas particularly well, or certainly no country at which we can point and say that is the right model uh, to move ahead. One of the questions which is underpinning so much discussion here today is the ways in which the United States has probably moved from being the country best placed in relation to that to being a country that doesn't look as favorably placed uh, on that scale today. And I think Luigi has brought home in his way some of the reasons for that, the rise of the power of money and lobbying in campaign finance. Uh, and we've heard equally some of the specifics about how that has fed through to innovation and the absence of innovation in parts of the, uh, uh, in parts of the medical world. In particular, the regulatory burdens which have been described have been the fairly direct product of the decline in trust in that particular industry, which has a well-founded basis in the ways in which companies there have actually developed their, um, their business model. In other words, what we need to do is to try and find a balance between the social cohesion uh, that restricts corruption and promotes trust and openness uh, to disruptive innovation. And that's, uh, I think, not at all easy to do. But it's our success in doing it that will, I think, in the long run, determine where we are placed on a spectrum between Bob Gordon's pessimism and Joel Mokir's technological optimism. Thank you. <laughs>